I went to my mother, who gave me this book. I led us to a young poet, Raina Maria Rilke. It's a fabulous writer. A fellow used to write to him and say, I want to be a writer. Please read my stuff. And Rilke says to this guy, don't ask me about being a writer. If when you wake up in the morning, you can think of nothing but writing, then you're a writer. I'm going to say the same thing to you. If you wake up in the morning and you can't think of anything but singing first, then you're supposed to be a singer, girl. Hey, welcome to On Books. Chris here. That in the intro is Whoopi Goldberg in Sister Act 2. Yeah, they made two of those. And she's giving advice to a young Lauren Hill on the question of whether or not she should become a singer. And she quotes from Letters to a Young Poet. But yeah, as you can guess, today's book is Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke. And here's how On Books works. If you've never read the book before, you know, that's great because I'm going to give you a summary. I'm going to read from it a bit, give some highlights. If you have read the book, also cool. Stick around because um, maybe it'll be a review or maybe you'll hear some things that you didn't catch the first time. So that's what we're going to do here. So I'm a huge fan of Letters to a Young Poet. If you don't know, if you're not familiar, the whole book, it's about 100 pages, and it consists of 10 letters that the poet Rainer Maria Rilke wrote to a student who was becoming a writer um, back around 1903. So it's, it's, it's quite some time now, but the lessons in it whew, are so good. I first heard of Letters to a Young Poet about five years ago. I was writing a music column called The Sound of Songwriting, and in the column I'd ask musicians, hey, you know, what, what, like, how do you write songs? <laughs> and like, what, what makes you feel creative, right? Who are some of your mentors? And it was during that time uh, when I was doing the interviews that I would hear musicians cite this book as their inspiration to write letters to a young poet. And it was Pamela from a band Tella Textile. She had used some of the some of the letters in a song she had referenced it and she read uh, or sent to me a, a verse from from it which i'm going to read to you now it starts off try to love the questions and and when she sent this to me it just it just gave me chills because it's it's franz you know and he's asking rilke for the answers he wants the answers and what rilke writes him back is he says try to love the questions try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books written in a foreign language do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. It is a question of experiencing everything. At present, you need to live the question. Whew, that just happened. Good stuff, right? So try to love the questions. That's from the f fourth letter. So here's what you need to know. This all starts when Franz Kappas, a 17-year-old student and poet in Prague, writes Rilke. The year is 1903, and Rilke now is in Paris. Rilke went to the same school that Franz is in now, but about 10 years ago. So again, Franz is 17. Rilke is only 10 years older than him. He's 27. And I mention that because it's amazing. And when I read, you'll see the way that Rilke expresses himself is so clear. I mean, it sounds as if he's some, you know, uh, well-established, wise, older man. He's well beyond his years, but he's 27 writing these letters. So Roque gets these letters from Franz, and what Franz is asking him is he's saying, hey, Roque, you know, I want to be like you. How do I do that? How do I write? He's saying, look at my writing. I send you my writing. I want you to read it and tell me if it's good. Tell me if I'm good. And that's interesting, too. An interesting thing about the book is it's all one way. We don't actually read Franz's letters at any point. We infer all of that from reading Rilke's responses. So it's 10 responses from Rilke. And, you know, that's kind of good because it, it makes it interesting. It has an interesting edge to it. It also makes it a bit shorter. So you're only reading, uh, it's like one-way reading of, of Rilke's part. So... I want to kick it off with the first letter. I'm going to read it in its entirety. So this is Rilke's response to Franz. It's uh, dated 17th of February, 1903, written from Paris. My dear sir, your letter reached me just a few days ago. 
I want to thank you for the deep and loving trust it revealed. I can do no more. I cannot comment on the style of your verses. Critical intent is too far removed from my nature. There is nothing that manages to influence a work of art less than critical words. They always result in more or less unfortunate misunderstandings. Things are not as easily understood nor as expressible as people usually would like us to believe. Most happenings are beyond expression. They exist where a word has never intruded. Even more inexpressible are works of art. Mysterious entities, they are, whose lives, compared to our fleeting ones, endure. Having said these things at the outset, I now dare tell you only this, that your verses do not as of yet have an individual style. Yet they possess a quiet and hidden inclination to reveal something personal. I felt that very thing most notably in your last poem, My Soul. There, something of your inner self wants to rise to expression. And in the beautiful poem, To Leopardi, something akin to greatness and bordering on uniqueness is sprouting out toward fulfillment. However, the poems cannot yet stand on their own merit and are not yet independent. Not even the last one, To Leopardi, not yet. In your kind letter accompanying them, you do not fail to admit to and to analyze some shortcomings, which I could sense while reading your verses, but could not directly put into words. You ask whether your poems are good. You send them to publishers. You compare them with other poems. You're disturbed when certain publishers reject your attempts. Well now, since you have given me permission to advise you, I suggest that you give all that up. You are looking outward, and, above all else, that you must not now do. No one can advise and help you. No one. There is only one way. Go within. Search for the cause. Find the impetus that bids you to write. Put it to this test. Does it stretch out its roots in the deepest place of your heart? Can you avow that you would die if you were forbidden to write? Above all, in this most silent hour of the night, ask yourself this, must I write? Dig deep into yourself for a true answer. And if it should ring its ascent, if you can confidently meet this serious question with a simple, I must, then build your life upon it. It has become your necessity. Your life, in even the most mundane and least significant hour, must become a sign a testimony to this urge. Then draw near to nature. Pretend you are the very first man and then write what you see and experience, what you love and lose. Do not write love poems, at least not at first. They present the greatest challenge. It requires a great, fully ripened power to produce something personal, something unique. When there are so many good and sometimes even brilliant renditions in great numbers. Beware of general themes. Cling to those that your everyday life offers you. Write about your sorrows, your wishes, your passing thoughts, your belief in anything beautiful. Describe all that with fervent, quiet, and humble sincerity. In order to express yourself, use things in your surroundings, the scenes of your dreams, and the subject of your memories. If your everyday life appears to be unworthy subject matter, do not complain to life, complain to yourself. Lament that you are not poet enough to call up its wealth. For the creative artist, there is no poverty. Nothing is insignificant or unimportant. Even if you were in a prison whose walls would shut out from your senses the sounds of the outer world, would you not then still have your childhood, this precious wealth, this treasure house of memories? Direct your attention to that. Attempt to resurrect these sunken sensations of a distant past. You will gain assuredness. Your aloneness will expand and will become your home, greeting you like the quiet dawn. Outer tumult will pass it by from afar. If, as a result of this turning inward, of the sinking into your own world, poetry should emerge, 
you will not think to ask someone whether it is good poetry, and you will not try to interest publishers of magazines in these works. For you will hear in them your own voice. You will see in them a piece of your life, a natural possession of yours. A piece of art is good if it is born of necessity. This, its source, is its criteria. There is no other. Therefore, my dear friend, I know of no other advice than this. Go within and scale the depths of your being from which your very life springs forth. At its source, you will find the answers to the question, whether you must write. Accept it, however it sounds to you, without analyzing. Perhaps it will become apparent to you that you are indeed called to be a writer. Then accept that fate, bear its burden and its grandeur without asking for the reward, which might possibly come from without. For the creative artist must be a world of his own and must find everything from within himself and in nature, to which he has betrothed himself. It is possible that, even after your descent into your inner self and into the secret place of solitude, you might find that you must give up becoming a poet. As I have said, to, to feel that one could live without writing is enough indication that, in fact, one should not. Even then, this process of turning inward, upon which I beg you to embark, will not have been in vain. Your life will no doubt from then on find its own path. That they will be good ones and rich and expansive. That I wish for you more than I can say. What else shall I tell you? It seems to me everything has been said with just the right emphasis. I wanted only to advise you to progress quietly and seriously in your environment. You could greatly interfere with that process if you look outward and expect to obtain answers from outside. Answer which only your innermost feelings in your quietest hour can perhaps give you. I was very happy to find in your writing the name of Professor Horak. Okay, so that's the professor that introduced the two of them. I had harbored the highest regard for this kindness of scholars and know him lasting regard. Would you please pass my sentiments on to him? It is very kind of him to think of me still, and I appreciate it. I am returning the verses with which you entrusted me. I thank you again for your unconditional and sincere trust. I am overwhelmed with it, and therefore have tried, to the best of my ability, to make myself a little more worthy than I am, as a stranger to you really am. With the sincerest interest and devotion, yours, Rainer Maria Rilke. So you can see that a large part of Rilke's advice in this first letter is go within yourself. Go and give yourself to writing. Get, by give yourself, he means, you know, give time, give time to writing. Put yourself in that situation. And if you come out the other end of this and what, you know, you go through the, the grandeur and you go through the hard times and you still want to be a writer, you're still producing, then you're a writer. And if you're, if you're not, and just, you need to own that and give that part of your life up. And by going through that and giving that up, then you'll open yourself to the next thing. But he's, he's recognizing this kind of neurotic, this like, you know, this creative neuroticism that we, we have. Should I, be a, should I be a writer, right? It's always on your mind, right? And you're thinking about it and you're, you're beating yourself up, right? If you're not putting in the time or you're not producing what in the back of your head you think you should be doing, should. Should's a dangerous word, right? We use that word so often, I should be. Who says I should be, right? You're saying that to yourself and you're holding yourself back. He's saying, be serious, make time right now. And he talks about being alone and that comes up in, in most of the letters actually, this idea of aloneness. I wanna read a passage from the sixth letter about aloneness. Rilke writes, what you really need is simply this, aloneness, great inner solitude. Go within and for hours not to meet anyone. That is what one needs to attain, to be lonely as one was as a child. While adults were moving about entangled with things that seem big and important because the grown-ups look so busy and because one could not understand any of their doings, that must be the goal. So here again, he's talking about finding the aloneness. And this speaks to me, th this idea of being alone, because every time I, 
I put energy into being creative, I generally have to sacrifice something else, right? You know, here in New York City, if I'm finding time to write, I have to say no to friends who are, you know, maybe out in Brooklyn drinking. And that's hard, right? That's a hard decision to have to make these sacrifices. You know, one way, one way that I, I, I put time into it is I'll put a little time every day, you know, as soon as I wake up. And then on Sundays, I'll put a big chunk, you know, about maybe three or four hours and I'll go to a cafe and I'll make a, a thing of it, like a habit. And that helps, right? But still you're there and, and you're alone. And if you spend that time and don't get anywhere, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to beat myself up. I think it was uh, John Green who said, uh, writing is like a bad game of Marco Polo because you're essentially you're in a basement and you're alone and you're writing and you're like, Marco, Marco, Marco. And then four years later, somebody, you know, reads your work and it's like, ah, Polo, I get it, Polo, right? <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, it's a lonely time and, you know, great writers, I, I've been learning that great writers will treat that time like a job, right? I spoke with uh, Sam Bean of Iron and Wine once and I asked him, you know, can you take me through the process of, of writing a song? What, what's that like? And he said, you know, I treat songwriting like a job where he sits down after he takes the kids to school and he'll sit there all day until he has to pick them up. And he does that Monday through Friday. And he admitted, you know, some days, you know, maybe most days, just nothing will come out, right? Or you won't really feel like you're making progress. But I have to be there alone because when the good stuff comes, someone's got to be there to catch it. So thanks again for listening to On Books. This is Chris. Uh, if you like the show, please subscribe on iTunes. You can do that by searching uh, On Books or your podcast app on your iPhone, just On Books and subscribe. You should read the book. Uh, it's short. Yeah, I'll put a link to it on my site as well as some quotes and notes from the uh, from the podcast, from the episode. And I'll even put a link. Um, you know, it's in public domain, so there are a bunch of um, just, just the entire text on the internet that you can scan through. I really do feel like the book is just nice to read through instead of reading it all on the internet. But I'll put that up on my site as well. And the book is free on Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com forward slash on books, I set up a coupon code so it will be free if it's your first book over there. So uh, they'll read through all of the letters. You can check that out. It's pretty good. All right. And uh, finally, some credits. Just thanks to Taylor Bentz and Birdstar for the music. All right. This has been On Books. And thanks for listening. What's the point of your story, sister? What's the point? Read the book. <laughs> <laughs>